Uh, I'm Matt Lundgren. I am the CMIO at Nuance slash Microsoft and formally uh, worked with Kurt to build this thing, this Amy Center. So I'm really, really, really happy to see all of you here. Um, obviously it grew a lot, maybe because I left. I don't know, it feels weird to <laughs> see the growth all of a sudden, but I won't take it personally. Um, okay, so this is gonna be a fireside chat, although, uh, do we have any fire graphics? No, okay. I would have done that if I was still here, by the way. Um, and this is gonna be the, the logistic regression session. No, I'm sorry, generative AI, generative AI. Okay, who knew? Uh, yeah, this is gonna be the AI revolution in medicine. Um, we've got some awesome experts here, and I'm just gonna play host today. Uh, starting out, we have Xavier Amatron. He is the VP of product strategy at LinkedIn, which is obviously a sister company of ours. And he leads company-wide generative AI efforts, everything from platform to infrastructure to product features. He's also a board member of Cure AI Health, uh, which is a startup that he helped co-found and was CTO until just recently. So lots of experience in healthcare and LLMs. Uh, we're also joined by Anitha Kanan. She's a machine learning expert uh, and key member of the Cure AI Health team. She actually serves as the head of machine learning for now. And her background uh, is extensive, but she's basically worked at every major lab in the country. Well, maybe I guess the world, including being advised by Jeff Hinton in the pre-Google days. So pretty awesome panel. So why don't we uh, come on up and we'll get started. Please. Oh. Oh, the high chair. Can you, can you hear us? Yes. All right. I'll try to turn. All right. So uh, I've come up with some questions, um, but I would definitely love to hear from this crowd because I can tell there's a lot of... Wait, it wasn't friends. you. It was ChatGPT. <laughs> it's true. Actually, I did use ChatGPT. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer to everything, right? Okay. So for both of you, just to start out, um, since you're both kind of at the intersection of machine learning and healthcare, or at least for a long time, were... Um, and now that we're sort of experiencing this kind of revolution, can you tell me how you first got into machine learning and healthcare, generally speaking, um, and then kind of maybe talk about where you think things are going with the things that you're working on? Go ahead. Sounds good. Um, maybe just a little bit before I start that, can I ask a question to the audience? Absolutely. How many people have felt like, if you raise, just raise your hands because we've been having a fun uh, week. Uh, if you have um, wanted to see a doctor, but had to wait for a very long time, and you didn't get to access to it, how many people? Well, you have a lot of doctors in the room, so maybe. <laughs> well, uh, OK, I'll ignore the doctors. <laughs> it's a great Never question. at Stanford, though. Never at Stanford, I guess. <laughs> it's a bad question for Stanford. Uh, yeah, so maybe a little bit about myself. My own experience of coming into healthcare is really driven by this question because uh, my father had a very serious terminal illness and we had access to amazing set of medical experts round the clock for about five years. Something that I that maybe took it for granted a little bit oh, when, I, when they were helping us, but when after his death, when I thought about it, it just became very clear that that was actually a luxury while it should actually be in something that everyone should get access to, right? It's if, if, birth, if healthcare is a birthright, everyone should have access to, like, just like in this team where most people are not raising their hands. I wish the whole world has that, but 50% of the world population don't even have access to care. I think a lot of why I joined Curai about six years ago has to do with that. Like, how can we bring a care team to every physician, every uh, patient, every user, like, you know, when you say user, everyone, even just not even prevent uh, proactive care, right? How can you bring that to everyone? And that just led me to where I am here. So to answer your question really is what made me move into healthcare space is really answering this question of how can we enable everyone to have a care team for themselves. And the only thing I knew reasonably well to do was machine learning. And the only thing I could bring to the table, along with all the other work, is just how can we use machine learning for this? So my entire journey with Curai, seven, six, seven years, is, is about like how can AI be part of the CAD team? And how would you introduce AI into the mix of CAD team so that you can have access to doctors at the time that you need, or at least someone on the CAD team for the time you need? 
Maybe that's where I will start, and so that may start your journey for what it means uh, to have a care team. Awesome. Yeah, no, and I think you know a lot of people. In fact, uh, most of the researchers in this room probably share that that vision, right? Yep. Wanting to apply your skills to something that yep. brings you meaning. How about you? Um, pretty similar. I have always um, so I come from tech, and I have been working in AI and machine learning for many, many years, as you can tell by the color of my beard. Um, uh, I was at Netflix, so I started the machine learning team at Netflix, building recommender systems that got you all hooked into watching more shows. And then I said, I need a better mission in life than doing that. <laughs> so It worked, though. I mean, yes. It I, did. I, <laughs> um, although, I, you know, I got blamed for a lot of bad recommendations <laughs> over my life. Um, but... Um, I, I, I remember when I was a kid and people asked me, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I always said, I want to be a doctor. Um, however, I soon realized I'm pretty bad with blood and uh, I get dizzy when they, uh, I get blood uh, drawn and I, I'm like, this is not going to work. So uh, fast forward when uh, we decided to start Cura, I thought, well, that, this is the, really the closest I'm going to ever be to being a doctor. And I'm not going to be a doctor, but I'm going to be working with a lot of great doctors, and I think uh, I'm also a very big fan, and I love uh, intersection of uh, different communities coming together and working together for a good mission, and I think that's pretty much what uh, got me to work in healthcare, is learning more about medicine, but really working with people that were experts in medicine and working hand in hand um, with, with them and trying to do something good for the world. I will say, it is hard, but it's, uh, it is something that, uh, as probably all of you in this room uh, agree with, it's, it's worth uh, the effort, right? Yeah, I think, you know, when you think about, like, your, your expectations of healthcare, and then when you started digging in the weeds, you, you know, trying to apply methods, and did, did, was there a moment where you're just like, man, I can't believe this is how things are done in healthcare, or something that surprised you that you're just like, why isn't this, why isn't this different? Why isn't this fixed? Is there... Is there a moment where you just, you know, we got to fix this thing? Um, I, I will say, um, so first of all, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm an immigrant. So I come from Europe where healthcare is, uh, at least in my country, is, is very different. There's a very public healthcare system and whatnot. And what I did realize working in healthcare in the U.S., it's that it was worse than I expected. <laughs> So there's a lot of systemic issues that are beyond sort of like the, the things that you can solve with technology. Uh, and it's about the misalignment of incentives and sort of like different layers of misalignment and all of that. So I think for me, probably that was the, the biggest realization working in healthcare. It's, it's not enough that you do the right thing for the patient, which is hard enough. It's like you need to do the right thing for the patient and for everyone else who is in the loop and wants to make money out of it, right? So that's the kind of like, for me, uh, a, you know, a big hard uh, finding and I think something that uh, goes even beyond technology that needs to be solved, right? How do you strip the system out of all those misaligned incentives? I do think though that you can do, and that's one of the things Anita was talking about with bringing the cost of healthcare down and making it very accessible to everyone, you can, you can remove some of those barriers and you can remove some of those intermediaries uh, that are sort of like making access cost and everything else so much harder. I, don't know. I think uh, even just amount of time the doctors spend with the patient, that's huge for me, right? Because Too much, too little. What do you think? It really depends on the context, I think, right? Sometimes it's too much, sometimes it's too little. And you really want to know how to prioritize and how to spend more time with patients who really need that versus someone who doesn't need it. So I think that trade-off, figuring out that is what it is. It's not about like, here's a 15-minute window of time that I'll get after three weeks that I can go and talk to the doctor. Right? It's just that sometimes you just need this continual uh, discussion. For my father, it was like really having this, every now and then we had like a one, two minute conversation sometimes. Right? And I felt like even here, I mean, I have one of the best healthcare uh, insurances, I think, but even here, I think it takes a lot of time for me. 
uh, when it could be done offline, when it could have been asynchronous. So Cura Health is great. I'm just pitching a little bit for the company. But, <laughs> but I really think that being able to adapt how much time a doctor needs to spend, and is it the, really the doctor? Is it a coach? Or is it, what is it? And being able to adapt and be really personalizing you know, for that patient is going to be important. And that's why you're going to get the biggest ROI, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and I think, so I'm hearing two things. I mean, obviously, the alignment problem is one big one, right? Just like how the incentives work. I think all of us go through this when we start out, um, even in med school, right? That we learn medicine, and all of a sudden, it's like, well, there's an insurance, there's a pharmacy, there's all these other things going on in their lives. Um, and then there's this billing part, right? This documentation thing that we do. That's all kind of a shock to all of us. And then I'm you know, also hearing just like, how do you manage? I don't really know how complex this is going to be. I, I get paid the same in some cases. Like, how does that work? Um, when you think about applying machine learning, um, it's kind of just a tool. Now, if we, even if we aren't talking about generative AI, just, for one, just give me one more minute before we get to ChatGPT. Um, if we're thinking about the narrow AI kind of days, right, where we're thinking about, okay, I can automate this process, I can automate this process. Um, have you seen success in, in some of those uh, use cases? And, and, and if, you, if you have, what, what, have you, what have you seen the most success in with that, again, that narrow AI approach? So I feel like it's not about like, here is one use case and here is another use case. I really think that we have to be thinking about uh, holistically what the workflow process looks like and how does it actually weave into the doctor's workflow and how do you make that workflow really well, right? Just figuring out like one particular problem and trying to figure where I can put that in is not going to be as effective. The second thing is that you're not guaranteed there's 100% precision in all of these, right? Then you're looking at how do I collect the data back end to improve on it? And how do I coach my doctors also to figure out that this may be wrong, right? So you don't want to get into the complacency of the doctors because it's looking it's good. I mean, we're going to see a lot of that in the generative AI space, but it's already looking too good, right? So. How do we think about that? So you have to, it's not just ML alone. Something we have learned over the last six years at Cura Health is like, it's not about just ML, it's just one piece of the puzzle. You need the uh, experts in the, in the clinical field to help you with it. You need the UX folks, you need the engineering. There's a lot of things, you have, even just the EHR has to be redesigned for us to really be amenable to all of that. Right? So thinking about this holistically is gonna be super important and we have to continue to do that more of. And there's more open challenges with, uh, with using generative AI as well in this space. Yeah, I will um, follow up on that and, and say it's, it's really key and really important that we uh, acknowledge, uh, all of us, that technology on its own doesn't solve problems, right? It's, technology is a tool that you can use in the context of a workflow and people that use it, and all of it needs to go hand in hand. I mean, I need to mention the magic EHR word word, right? It's like um, the, the way that EHRs were usually or in the old days were sort of like dropped in a medical system is like, hey, good luck. This is going to solve all your problems. And now you're all going to be happier. Obviously, that did not work. And it's the same with ML and AI, right? They, you can't get somebody coming from the outside and say, hey, this is the magic algorithm that you're going to use. Now figure it out. It's, it's a process. And also very importantly, like the humans, the doctors, and the patients need to also adapt to this new process and um, manage um, ways to change the workflow and build sort of like this end-to-end -end understanding because otherwise it's just something that it's going to sit on the side and it's, it's going to do more harm than good, right? Because you're going to be using it wrong. It's not going to be mm, used in the way that it should. I think that... Uh, um, Ability to adapt the whole system to new technologies is something that is essential. Yeah, and I think, again, using it as a tool, I think that is exactly right. I think we have to find ways to get across the whole care continuum. Now that we are sort of moving into this generative AI space, right? So we've all seen GPT-4, um, hopefully. Uh, we've all seen what it can do uh, on across a broad range of categories. and. Uh, you know, I think someone else said this, but I, I think it really is interesting that it kind of changes the information asymmetry, right? Um, for patients, for other physicians, right, to, to have access to information, have a conversation about a topic or um, even a patient. How do you, rather than having to change the system, is this a technology that's broad enough and malleable enough and performant enough to potentially use um, across the care continuum to your, to your point, uh, and rather just as, a, even if it was a, just a technology backing things, could it potentially be the front door technology? Is this, uh, is this how it will go in the future? 
Can I? Sorry. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> just, just to uh, contradict myself a little bit, but uh, also answer part of your question. It's also important to understand that uh, if the system doesn't change holistically, the users will find their way around it, right? And just as a reminder, before ChatGPT or any of that, a lot of people, I think the uh, latest statistic I, I saw before ChatGPT was around 30% of Americans were using Google to self-diagnose, right? They were like, hey, I can't get a doctor, it's taking too long, I'll just Google it and go to WebMD and guess this is what I have, right? So it, I'm just saying that uh, generative AI is just another uh, piece of the puzzle, but we need to use it in a way that sort of like it works with the system because otherwise, users are gonna work uh, around the system. Because as you, to your point, it can be a front door, but that was the same with Google, right? You can ha use a search engine and go somewhere and say, oh, this is my disease, and people do it all the time. We know it. They show up with a pile of, yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, to the doctor's office, absolutely. Well, the people who have doctors, the ones who <laughs> can sure. access them, Fair. they just you know, try to get whatever drug they think they need, right? So. I would say that GPT-4 definitely have a big jump into what is possible very quickly. I would say that, but um, is this, I mean, there's a, I, I'm sure there's going to be a conversation around like, is it enough, right? I, I don't think it is enough, right? But are we getting a big uh, lift because of that? I think that's definitely there and because it's just doing really well. But uh, what oh, we got access to GPT-4 pretty early on and we did uh, do all the, you know, the, uh, USMLE exams, and I think we even tweeted about it before Microsoft actually did hey. post up for, you know, we had these results before. <laughs> you, you can get the, you can take the credit, but we did it. <laughs> we did, we took your paper and we published it. Actually. Please cite us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, anyway, to go back to this, what we soon started when we started to try it out on, I mean, we have like extensive um, cl clinical innovation team that's doing a lot of human evaluations also across different use cases and all that stuff. We quickly started to find out that, you know, there are still areas for it to get better at, right? Even just on episodic care. I'm not even thinking about longitudinal care. Just episodic care alone is just like, there's still a uh, famous word we use, hallucinations, but there's also a lot of things for omissions. Right, which are even more important because at least when it's hallucinating, you can go back to the patient and ask, is this correct? Uh, or you can go back, but if it omits something from a very long history, the patient may very likely to think, oh, uh, maybe they just intentionally did not include this information because it's not, it's not useful. But really, uh, that may have been the key piece of information. So how do you, I mean, we start to work actually, we have like a research division that actually does a lot of exploratory work as well. And uh, we started to look at how can we improve uh, uh, these systems, even just on the episodic care, right? So one of our work was on like as having two agents, both are actually GPT-4 agents, but kind of work together. And um, one is like actually doing the work, other one is like a researcher, just mm -hmm. giving you hands on, hands on, hey, think about this, think about that kind of thing. But I think the key really here is to be very intentional about what, where, what, where are you using this and how are you using it and how much human evaluations have you done um, and how to think about automated evaluations and this. Like the whole slew of things has to be taken into account, I think, uh, to be actually make it really robust enough to even put it in front of the providers. And we talked about how uh, provider complacency is a question we should always be having in your head. So Can I ask you just to follow up on one quick thing you said? So I, um, I don't know if everyone caught all that, but like the, the, the one thing that I'm really interested in is that you know you hear a lot of people using GPT as a input output, yep. like one dimensional. Yep. And the, the, I'm really a big fan of the work you guys did. Um, if you haven't seen the paper, DER, I think is right. Um, you actually use two agents because we also know that GPT can self-correct. It can look and say, "This is actually what I would do differently," right? And then surface that back. And it's recursion, right? You can do that multiple times. You can ground it. How have you thought about? Now that you're kind of in the more than one dimensional space with GBT, are, are you thinking like as an ecosystem then? Have you, have you built on that work to say actually we were getting close to a place where uh, we're, we're clinically accurate across the board? So we are definitely building on those types of works and there's a bunch of work we have done. I think uh, in, within Curai, we haven't published all of it, I would think, but I think the key really is even there, you know, in, I think in the one, biggest thing you have to always remember, especially for ML machine learning folks is that, uh, in medical domain, which is, you have to get 100%. Like, 
like that hundred percent is huge number, right? And because that's not always possible, you always need to have a fallback mechanism of going to the human, the medical experts, and you need to figure out how do you get push the boundaries for these models, but at the same time, how do you integrate it effectively that the humans can look at it when needed? And then how do you balance that? And even you can balance that, then you don't have to feel like, oh, I can never use these systems. But rather, you're going to be saying, OK, how do I use my UX very well for my provider to understand that there may be mistakes here, can look at it. Right? And how do you build that full ecosystem is going to be like the key. And that's something that we spend a lot of time. So at Curai, we have like a UX. Um, researchers, UX engineers, you have a product engineering team, you have the EHR team that's looking at it, and the physicians, clinicians themselves, and even a clinical innovation team, along with ML. So all of these teams are coming together to kind of think about these things. Yep. Can I add a quick thing? Please. I, I think, um, um, or a couple of things, but uh, right on this topic, I, I think, uh, I, I was telling you before, I have a blog post that if you all search it, I, I compare LLMs with medical doctors. And um, for the medical doctors in the room, it, it might be an interesting read, but there's a, there's a lot of interesting literature about the accuracy on, of diagnosis of doctors on uh, real cases, on vignettes, on everything else. And uh, roughly a, a, a popular paper, or at least a, a, I think an, a very interesting paper that was published uh, just four or five years ago on uh, JAMA was about the accuracy of doctors on easy cases and hard cases, which was pretty much 50% on both easy and hard. And the other important data point, for me the most important data point, is that the uh, confidence that doctors had on both kinds of cases was roughly the same. It was 70 versus 65, so, or, or 75 versus 65 on easy to hard cases. Um, and um, I think that's a very good metaphor of what uh, language models are. And I'm a big fan of teaching everyone, including doctors, but also users in general, of this fact. You know, the, uh, language models will never be 100% accurate, just as doctors are never 100% accurate. And what do you do when you get a diagnosis from a medical doctor and it's something that is very uh, severe or you're like, you have questions about it. Well, you ask a second doctor, and you get a panel of experts, and then you make a decision if you have the money to do so or the resources, right? Um, so I think of uh, language models as pretty much the same, meaning you should not trust a single language model. You should ask another one. You should ask your doctor. You should then gather different opinions, and then you should make uh, uh, an informed decision based on all the information you have. Uh, and I think that's very key, and, and the other very important thing that I would um, maybe throw in is when I get this question about like, you know, how good is GPT-4 right now, what I say is like, that doesn't really matter. <laughs> what matters is how much better is GPT-4 than what we had a year ago, and how do you track the curve of progress of these models, and what do you see looking forward, right? Like, if you look at what we have today, what we had a year ago, and you're like, whoa, this looks like an exponential. It's like, okay, well, look forward to next year and to five years from now, and how are you getting ready for that, right? Whether today it's more or less accurate, whether it passes this exam or it doesn't pass it, or it's like not totally accurate, it's anecdotal. I mean, what is really key is like how this, this quickly is prog progressing and how are we adapting to it and uh, are we going to make good use of it because we're getting ready. And not so much the present, but it's more about like the curve of progress, right? Totally agree. I don't know how GPT-5 would look like. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I think that's a great segue into sort of this, what is gonna happen next part. Um, but uh, it really is that we live in a linear world. We think linearly where we thought we were gonna be, we were way off, right? You can ask any expert, they were way off. And we're in this kind of exponential curve. Now what we don't know is this a sigmoid, or is this a hockey stick? They've, they've suggested that we're running out of data. Um, on the other hand, I don't think GPT has seen any significant amount of real-world data, to our knowledge. But what do you think is going to be GPT-5? What does that mean, and how would we prepare? Because it seems like we were barely prepared for GPT-4 uh, when, when it hit the scene. Um, and, and here we are all debating it. Are we, are we just sort of making sandcastles that will be washed by the ocean, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I think um, my opinion is 
Um, there's going to be better models. They're going to be bigger, but they're also going to be smaller, more efficient. I mean, there's many things about GPT-4 that are just not practical. It's very expensive. It's slow. It makes errors. So all those things will get better. Uh, but what I think it's key, it would, and, and that's, <laughs> it's a very controversial opinion, so don't take it as sort of like what everyone believes. But I, I, I do think we're going to get to a world very soon where we're going to, where we're going to have specialized versions of models that are going to be really good at something, and then we're going to be able to combine them as agents, right? Just as you have with different specialists in medicine or in your healthcare team, and you have doctors and nurses and nurse practitioners and uh, specialists in, in one particular uh, aspect of healthcare. I think uh, with language models and generative AI, what's going to happen, it's pretty much the same. You're going to have um, some models that are really good at maybe uh, visual cognition and understanding what's going on with the patient by looking at, at their eyes, right? And they're going to have another model that is sort of like going to be more conversational. And you're going to be able to sort of like tune them and, and specialize them in, in different things and then work with them together in a way that it's not so much about this, oh, what is GPT-5 going to do for me? It's going to be a, a number of different agents, if you will, that you're going to be working with, just as you use different tools uh, in your toolkit today, right? And you use uh, uh, your laptop for something and your cell phone for something else and your pen for uh, a different thing. I think it's, it's going to be a little bit like that. Now, that being said, I think the multimodality of the models that are coming, I mean, it's not a surprise, right? It's like uh, many of you might have seen there's even in in the context of GBD4, there are some demos. I, I think it's not fully available for everyone uh, still, but there's visual capabilities of GBD4 that can recognize images, and that's mind-blowing. So you can imagine, right? What if uh, language models now become multimodal, and they can see faces, and they can see images, and they can see an X-ray, and they incorporate that with information and with a conversation? I think that's going to be probably the next big thing, including voice, by the way. Voice is another modality that uh, is coming, and it's very, um, it's going to be fascinating to see. I, I think I would leave it to everyone's imagination what they want GPT-5 or anything to look like. But maybe there is like another angle to this, which is like, um, what about other companies? Like, what about Google coming out with it, Anthropic coming out of it? What about the open source ones? How are they all fitting in? And is there going to be a lock-in here, right? So because it's not like you can take a prompt from that you're using that you have specialized for one to kind of immediately apply to another one and do that best, right? Because there's a there's differences in the training data. There's differences in how they've been trained and so on, right? What does it mean uh, for you to be able to move between these different types of models that are available in the same class? And is that going to be a unification? Or are we going to be rethinking how all of this come together? Because I think there's still a lot of open questions. Right? If you've invested a lot of time on a particular uh, language model, it's, it's going to be really hard for someone to move to a different one. Because again, the, I'll go back to this automated evaluation, right? If you have to do a lot of automated evaluation that are really good, you have to start thinking about how do you evaluate really well for your tasks, right? And I feel like we need to be solving all of these open questions while there is always a group of people who are going to be trying the next set of models, but I think there's a lot of still open questions that are largely unsolved that probably my head is on right now, but. <laughs> But I would think that everyone can imagine what that would look like, and I'm looking forward to what that would look like. Yeah. Maybe a lot of the things we did now in the next one year or two years would be like obsolete when it, when it comes out, and you may start again from scratch. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. I don't know how much time we have left, but I'd, I'd love to hear from all of you if you have any questions. Uh, do we have time for one? Uh, Kurt? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Anybody have a question? I'm, I'm outsourcing my work here, so please. Oh, we got one guy behind you, and then, yeah, we'll have you next. Uh, my name is Ved, and uh, my question is, diagnosis is one of the problems that uh, people are working in LLM. What are the other low-hanging fruit in the care that uh, LLM can like uh, do better, or like something that can be targeted in the whole patient journey? 
Go on, go ahead. Uh, maybe I will ask you what is a problem that you want to tackle, and maybe it's better to start from there. <laughs> because I feel like a lot of the problems that people have been thinking for a very long time is starting to look like they're reasonably can be solved. Now, so all the way from conversational intake, right? I think, so it's, I mean, at Cura Health, we use it. If you're on, on our Cura Health platform, you'll notice it. So there is a lot of problems that felt like this is going to be hard and starting to be. So I would even think that every problem that you've worked on or you've come across, you can start asking the question, if it's related to, especially related to text, you can start asking the question, is this, uh, can you do it? And I, I feel like just that prompt engineering is a little bit of thing, but I think it'll be able to solve, is my thinking. I'm, I'm not even ca kind of giving you a no answer to the mean that it's actually a lot as possible. I, actually, to, to, to double down on that, I think that the trick with diagnosis yep. or the reason that it's always sort of like the one that is mentioned is because it's the one that we know how to measure exactly. more accurately, exactly. right? So we do have some notion of like, is this a valid diagnosis, yes or no? There's a differential. You can give a number of like accuracy and it's easy to measure. But it's not because it's the only one, right? There's a lot of different tasks like uh, conversational intake or um, uh, extracting information from the patient conversation or um, suggesting care plans. There's a lot of other different things that you can do with an LLM, particularly when it becomes multimodal. Um, but because we don't know really how to measure them with a number, we kind of like don't talk about them so much. And I think that's a mistake, right? Like if you, you, you need to do, use it for whatever you need and then find the metric, not the other way around saying, oh, because I know how to measure it, I'm gonna use it for diagnosis. Makes sense, thank you. Well, go ahead. Um, so thank you So today, um, you know, I've always been through the conversations envisioning the end user as the physician, but um, I work on our patient portal here at Stanford and, you know, always in our mind, the patient is the customer. And I'm wondering, when you envision the future of GPT, how much of it do you imagine will be empowering patients to be more actively involved in their care? And perhaps actually, you know, rather than building a co-pilot for um, physicians actually building a co-pilot for patients to navigate, you know, all these disparate care teams that are not talking to each other, navigating reimbursement, all of those problems. Does that mean I should take this question? <laughs> it's a hard question. It's, 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 it's a hard question. You, you like hard questions. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> so I really think um, both patients and providers have to come together to do a lot of the stuff and empowering patients, educating them and educating them to educate themselves on what to do and having those conversations with the providers and then and making sure that the providers have the time or are supported by AI, have some time, right? In both of these cases, I think there's a lot to do. And I, I keep pitching on to Cura Health because I, I just love my company a little too much. So I think for this, like we have been thinking about like both patient and the provider. So uh, our, our AI systems are, and is also enab enabling the patient a lot more autonomy and thinking about their things and also about the patient, uh, about the provider. So it's not about just co-piloting for the provider. I think the, the more the patient understands about their health, the easier it is for them to make the changes that they need to make. So just empowering uh, the patient is going to be like super important, I think, and it will continue to be important because it's just so much easier when there's an intrinsic need to make a diff, right? And I think that's, we should do that. And follow it, yeah. No, I was just gonna add, I, th I think one of the key words that Anita mentioned, education is key, right? Empowering the patient doesn't mean yeah. what I mentioned before, just search on Google and good luck. Yeah. It, it's the same with chat GPT or GPT-4 or 10, right? It's like, again, hey, here's your agent, good luck, um, take care of yourself, because you need to be able to interpret what that means and how to talk to it, and, and just like you should be able to interpret what your doctor is telling you, right? Because it's not always that obvious, but at least you have both sides. Yeah. I'll probably just add one thing, because, you know, why not? Um, <laughs> I think that the other thing that's really interesting about what's happening is you can take that use case and, you know, we run the clock a year or two and, right, you had to get a whole team, you had to get a huge budget, you had to just even get a prototype off the ground. 
And you know what we're seeing is you know people are building these things in weekends. They're they're able to leverage right various open source or platform based tools, and they're able to build a pretty interesting and usable product right or or use case. Uh, and and so I think that's also an interesting angle to this, which is that I don't think you're going to have those same kind of barriers, even if you're not a PhD in computer science. I think you can still accomplish quite a bit, um, and that I think unlocks a lot of the the ecosystem. And again, if you have a use case you're passionate about, I think it's possible to start tackling it. Are you saying doctors are going to take our jobs? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nobody English takes majors. nobody's yes. jobs. You English just keep majors. augmenting everyone. That's right. uh, maybe one, do we have one more? we have time for one more? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Anybody got a, uh, I see a hand in the back. It's going to take a minute. You can just shout. Yeah, it's going to. So the question was, uh, what's the what's the future of data training, annotation, all that stuff? Is that is that am I getting that? Yeah. yeah okay. What do you think? Data. How how important is data now? Yeah, I, I think the key aspect of data and annotations for me is not so much on the training uh, side. It's more on the evaluation, right? Like, how do we know that a system is correct or not correct, or how correct it is, and how can we evaluate that in a way that makes sense? I mean, you could argue that some of the um, you know, traditional exams that we have for determining whether somebody can become a doctor or a lawyer or whatnot, that's a good starting point, but it's really not, right? It's like, that's what we humans have used, but we need better benchmarks and better ways to understand. It's like, hey, this model is actually pretty good at pediatrics, and it's actually this much good, and this is how much it can be trusted, this is how much it cannot be trusted, and having sort of like this evaluation benchmarks or even more than that sort of like pipelines, I, I think it's gonna be really interesting. I was in a talk uh, a few months ago by somebody from the FDA where they were even considering like, should we have some hidden data sets where we measure things that people submit and we can at least say this is how good they are at a particular medical task? Maybe, I am not entirely sure that's the solution, but I think it is key that we understand how to evaluate and how to give numbers to these models and, how, and we can say how good they are at different tasks. That's on data? Yeah. yeah. No, Anything? No. We'll go to the next one. Yeah, well, I'll just make a quote. Because, I mean, obviously, I think at Stanford, uh, Kurt's still here. I, we, you know, we spend so much time, even early on, right, making data available, right, in, this, in the paradigm that, you, you know, having as much data as possible in the community was a value add, and I, and I still think that that's true, right? I think that there's the conversations that we have, maybe they're around benchmarks, maybe there's just parts of the work that we're all doing that, that maybe um, companies won't explore, but certainly academia would explore, and that's gonna be useful for all of us. Um, uh, but I think, it, you know, you've seen a lot of the work in, you know, synthetic data generation, and um, I, I think that there's a, you know, still an open question as to whether synthetic data um, is sufficient to either benchmark or achieve some of the tasks that, that we're looking to achieve. Um, but, uh, but I definitely agree with the, the idea of we have to agree on what are the metrics we're chasing. Uh, I think that's it. Hope you all enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good job. Good job. Thank you so much, panelists. Let's, let's thank not only these panelists again, but all the speakers and panelists we've heard throughout the day. It's, uh, it's been a great meeting. I know I have learned a lot. I hope you've learned a lot. Um, I did learn something even more important, which is the one job that I think is least likely to be replaced by AI, and that's the HVAC engineer who fixed our air conditioning this morning. <laughs> you notice the temperature in here is much better. Uh, I, I have a couple of observations just, uh, you know, going through the sessions I thought I would share with you. Uh, the first session I thought was very interesting. We heard about ethics and the business case, and both of those need to be made, and they're in some ways very complementary. I also thought it was interesting to hear about who in the organization, how important it is that we identify who in an organization owns an algorithm. Who can turn it off? 
and that, in fact, some of these algorithms have been turned off. Uh, Mohammed mentioned that their batting average is about 700, which is pretty good by baseball. I don't know how it's going to be uh, in AI. Um, once the algorithm is implemented, very interesting to think about it as we all do about augmenting radiologists or other uh, clinicians. Uh, and in particular in radiology, we think about the detection rate. I was fascinated to hear about the wow cases. We talk about those a lot as you know, great catch kind of things. But I think that if you can show that the AI has those capabilities, that does give you a lot of credibility with the, with the uh, humans. And I really uh, also enjoyed hearing Nina Kotler talk about uh, educating the clinicians about where the failures happen, like what kinds of cases cause the failures. I think that's an interesting insight, was new to me. And then after implementation, uh, do users care if the model is down? That's a, that's a very good sign. Uh, I think that's true. Uh, assessment for bias when possible. We don't always have the data that we need, but that's a very important step. Uh, a lot of these algorithms are trained on data that in, in fact was itself created based on biased human decisions, so we have to be very cautious about that. Uh, the large language model sessions, I wanted to mention that if you're really interested in that, we did have a large language model uh, meeting, two-hour meeting, just about a month ago, co-sponsored with our High Institute and with uh, GSV, GSR Ventures and uh, the Moore Foundation. It's a very efficient way to learn more about language models. It's a, there was a quick introduction at the beginning by Nigam, and then we had three half-hour panels, one patient-focused, one physician-focused, and one ethics and policy-focused. And that's, on, again, on the Amy YouTube channel if you're interested in that. But I thought uh, it was fascinating to hear about the pipeline of open data. Uh, and that there is this huge open source community, including Hugging Face, including the uh, open data that we've released at the Amy Center. Um, I loved hearing about and learned a lot about, um, do you know what time it is? No, just kidding. Uh, hearing about pragmatics uh, and what I would think of as kind of context. And I think that there's going to have to be a lot of work around the context in which these algorithms are implemented because that is going to determine, in many cases, more than the semantics, how they're perceived and how they perform. Uh, and then I also thought it was fascinating the comment that uh, David Magnus made about dual use versus open source, and to think about how some of these technologies can be used by the wrong people for the wrong reasons, and we need to think about that as we widely disseminate both data and models. Uh, so uh, with that, I want to thank the staff, so Joanna, Kim, and her team, amazing group. Meetings like this don't happen by accident. So uh, thank you, team, Joanna, and group, everyone outside. We appreciate you. Um, and I'll turn it over to Joanna in a second, but I just wanted to uh, thank our online audience. We're saying goodbye to you right now. We'll be heading across the street to, for our Shark Tanks and our in-person uh, uh, breakout groups. And with that, I will turn it over to Joanna, who's going to give us some logistics about that. Thank you.